predator or protector? Critical question we need to all be asking ourselves in every context. But one of the realities that we have to address right up front is that whenever you're talking about harm, whenever you're talking about looking at difficult things, each one of us will have a natural response of our defenses coming up. Especially when we try to look honestly at the harm we've done someone we love. So whenever we're talking about pornography, sexual addiction, deceptive sexuality of any kind, uh, affairs, etc., within us, our defense mechanisms are going to naturally rise. And so one thing that can help us look at this more honestly and more deeply is to take a minute and just pause. Uh, Dr. Manwala has a process he calls ATC, Approach, Transition, Conditions. And so what we do to help that, one of the best approaches, one of the best transitions, one of the best ways to move into good conditions to allow us to look at these difficult things as well as we can is to pause and just take a deep breath. So please join me, take a deep breath. On a count of three, I'm going to invite you to inhale, and then we'll take a big exhale out together, and then we will approach this difficult subject. So join me on the count of three. One, two, three, inhale, and exhale. And then we'll join some extraordinary space looking at things that we've worked really hard in our lives to not look at so that we can move into better places. But where I want to start off, first of all, is with the idea of protector. I believe that God put in every single individual the essence of a protector. Think back to different motifs. You know, who didn't want to be the knight in shining armor? Or the cowboy in the white hat? Or think of the military recruitment ha advertisements. To serve, to protect. Think about your wedding vows, where we promise to love, honor, cherish, protect. And guys, it's not just a male thing either, though I think it is especially resonating for, for us as men. Because even, even women also have a great need, desire to be protectors. If you don't believe me, try to do some, challenge some mother's kids and watch Mama Bear come out. We all have, I believe, a God-given part of us that wants to be a protector. And from that, what, we, what I want you to see is that our brains have both a protector and a predator pathway. That within each one of us, in every situation, in every day, in every circumstance in our lives, we have two competing agendas going on within us. One is that of a predator, and the other is that of a protector. And unfortunately, especially in the sexual realm, our world conditions men to be consumers, devourers, and even predators of women, especially in the sexual arena. Media, especially porn, presents women as sex objects for male gratification. Boys, men therefore, learn early on to judge women whether on the categories of whether or not they are hot or not, and then a second category, are they vulnerable or not? And so in our predatory brain, when we determine a woman is hot, and then if we determine she's vulnerable, then we know there's an opportunity. Think about in advertising. How many products are sold with some sort of sexualized portion of their advertisement? I mean, let's think about it. What in the world does a woman in a skimpy outfit have to do with socket wrenches? And yet, if you look at any magazine ad, if you go into uh, garages, etc., and you see their calendars that they get from 
the mechanic companies, invariably they are promoting a very um, sexualized form of using the female body to sell their product. And in that, in that form, they become part of our cultural, part of the way our culture forces us into this mode of being a predator. It normalizes it. That's what men do. That's accepted. That's the norm. And so we are taught, we were taught from childhood to be predators in this arena. And then most of us, we got to 19, 20, 21, 25, some people 30, 40, and guess what happens? We get married. And in marriage, we hit what I call the crucible of marriage being a dividing place where we either protect or we prey upon. And so I want you to think for a minute about the difference between a predator and a protector. Okay, first of all, think of how we're called to be protectors. Ephesians 5.25, Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. I believe we can see from that passage that God calls us to be protectors of our wife, to love her, to give our lives away for her, just as Jesus did for the church. And so that's the good part of our heart. Unfortunately, however, there is a predatory part that also comes into play. And the predatory part that I want us to focus on tonight is that part of what Dr. Omar Manwala calls the secret sexual basement, or his acronym for it that I'll explain in a minute is the DCSR. And what does DS, DCR stand for? Well, it's just talking about this image that you can see of the secret sexual basement. If you can, look at the picture closely or just imagine the scene. Imagine a nice house in the suburbs, you know, white picket fence, two dogs, three kids. From the outside, everything looks like Norman Rockwell, perfect American home. But if you're able to step back and have ground-penetrating radar and look at the same scene, what you can see is that inside that house, the husband, the father, has gone into a back room, maybe a back closet, and he's pulled the carpet up. And he's removed the flooring, he's created a hatch, and he's dug a complete basement that no one else in the family knows about. And then, on a regular basis... He disappears, he goes down into his basement to participate in sexual behaviors. He looks at porn, he masturbates, he goes to strip clubs, maybe he even goes to affairs or prostitutes. You name it, and it could be there. And so there's this whole separate world that goes about. And then what he does is he goes back and forth between the two worlds. And when he's in his basement, he's in that world. And when he's up above, he puts on the mask, he looks the part, and everything seems like it's the way that it's supposed to be. So let's look at the acronym. The acronym starts off with D, and D is for deceptive. And guys, what I want you to see first of all here is that what's in the basement is actually secondary to just the fact that there's a secret basement created in the first place. That the very act of pulling up the rug, pulling up the floor, digging the basement, creating a secret world, that in and of itself is an entitlement that says, I should get what I want, when I want, how I want it. That in and of itself is our attempts, our efforts to make life work on our own terms. That I don't have to love my wife well. I don't have to face the fear of real emotional intimacy in order to get physical sexual intimacy. Because after all, when did porn ever turn us down? 
It means that I can create this world deceptively, and whether I go down there once a, once a day, whether I there once a week, once a month, once a year, is almost irrelevant. What's most important is the fact that I've created this deceptive place. And guys, I've worked with couples now for 22 years in this arena. And I will tell you that I cannot count how many times wives in an initial session or a session early on in the process will say something to the effect of, you know, his sexual, sac- his sexual acting out was bad enough. But the most painful thing is all the deception. I've had wives break down saying, does he think I'm that stupid? Or, on the flip side, what is so wrong with me that I didn't see this? And I constantly have to reaffirm to them, no, you were a woman who chose to trust your husband. It was him being deceptive. The next letter of the acronym is C. C stands for compartmentalized. Notice in this picture, the husband is at the table with his wife and child. But notice what he's wearing. He's got a mask on. He's pretending to be a certain way. But while he's upstairs, he's he's dad. He's good husband. He's what he wants the world to see. But notice the basement underneath. It's compartmentalized. He separates the two worlds. Now, just a quick note there. Compartmentalization is not a bad thing in and of itself. We all have to compartmentalize. The easiest example of that is, if you're having surgery tomorrow, do you want your surgeon to be able to compartmentalize? Of course you do, because if he leaves in the morning after having a big fight with his wife, do you want him to be able to set that aside and use his skills and training to focus on you? Of course you do. We all have to compartmentalize. But the problem is, when the compartmentalization is connected with the deception, then it creates a whole world that does incredible damage. The next letter of his acronym for the secret basement is S. And S stands for sexual slash relational. This place that he creates, this paradigm, this world that he creates, is... It's in the sexual realm. And the reason that's so significant is because sex always hits at our core place of attachment. And attachment is the core that God built our brains around. It is the very core foundation of our existence. Do you realize that small children, for survival, need attachment more than they need food? that a small child will abandon the quest for food if his attachment needs are not met. Why? Because that's how God created us. He created us to be attached, to be connected. And so when the secret basement is about sexual things, it strikes that core place of our attachment. It's also been said that there is what is called the triadic core in our psyche. And so the three most sensitive tissues of the human psyche are the tissues of our body, our gender, and our sexuality. So a secret sexual basement strikes right at the most tender, sensitive tissue in our wife's psyche. And then the last letter of the acronym is R. And R stands for reality. And the reason for that is because it's a creating of a whole nother world. 
that I've got my above the basement world, I've got my above the basement reality, I've got my below the basement reality. And guess what I do? I work especially hard to make sure those two worlds never come together. And in that reality, I keep everybody in my family spinning. So when my wife starts cleaning extra in that closet that has the carpet pulled away, guess what I do? Uh, um, honey, I'll, I'll clean that. We work especially hard to keep those two worlds from colliding. And we keep our secret sexual basement as a way of making our world of survival make sense in our own minds. And if you think about it for a minute, it starts to make sense, too. It starts to make sense why it's so crazy-making for those who live in the house with us. Because they're walking around, and, you know, just imagine, if you're doing stuff in the basement over time, guess what starts happening eventually? you got toxic fumes that start oozing up through the floorboards and the carpet. And how many times does a wife... What's that, what's that smell? Honey, do you smell anything? And our response is, oh, honey, you're, you're, you're imagining things. It, you know, let's, let's just open a window. Let's just get a little fresh air. All the while, the goal, the wor work, is to prevent her from discovering the truth and allowing those two worlds to collide. And so that leads us to a really hard word. It's the abuse word. Most men, especially early in recovery, if someone pulls out the abuse word, their defenses come flying up. Wait, 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 no, I, I, I'm not an abuser. I've never hit my wife. I, I haven't choked her. I haven't trapped her. I haven't done any of those things that we think of as abuse. But what I want you to understand here is that abuse comes in many different forms. And the abuse that I'm talking about here is directly addressed in the, Di the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disorders, which is the DSM-5, which is in essence the big Bible of psychiatry. It's what's used for insurance purposes, how to uh, code different problems that people have. And in the DSM-5, the most current version on page 721, it describes spouse or partner abuse psychological in this way, verbatim from the text. Partner psychological abuse encompasses non-accidental verbal or symbolic acts by one partner that result in or have reasonable potential to result in significant harm to the other partner. This category should be used when such psychological abuse has occurred within the past year. Continues, acts of psychological abuse include berating or humiliating the victim, interrogating the victim, restricting the victim's ability to come and go freely, Obstructing the victim's access to assistance, example, law enforcement, legal, protective, or medical resources. Threatening the victim with physical harm or sexual assault. Harming or threatening to harm people or things that the victim cares about. Unwarranted restriction of the victim's access to or use of economic resources. Isolating the victim from family, friends, or social support resources, stalking the victim, and trying to make the victim think that he or she is crazy. And notice that last line especially. Trying to make the victim think that he or she is crazy. Again, guys, that is the very definition of gaslighting. And that's what we do whenever we try to convince our wife that she doesn't see what she sees, hear what she hears, 
feel what she feels or experience what she has experienced. And by definition, it is a form of psychological partner abuse. And I have heard hundreds and hundreds of different ways that men with secret sexual basements have done that. A wife finds a internet history with all sorts of pornographic URLs, and when she confronts her husband with it, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never used that computer. I've had guys before throw their nine-year-old sons under the bus and said, oh, Johnny must have done it. Why? Because they are desperately trying to protect the secret sexual basement. And so guys, it's critical that we recognize the amount of harm that that does. And it's the primary reason why stopping the acting out behaviors isn't enough. You know, I think in the last 20 years or so in sexual addiction recovery, we've done a pretty good job in teaching and in groups and 12-step groups and different contexts of focusing on how important it is to stop the acting out behaviors. And by that I mean pornography, strip clubs, affairs, those external behaviors. And in most groups, in fact, in our group many times, that has become our focus. However, what we have to recognize is it's not the most damaging thing. That the greatest damage that has been done is the damage we have done in denying our wife's realities. The most damaging things we have done are our layer upon layer upon layer of deceptions. And from that, what we must understand is that husbands must see clearly the harm they have done in order to fully own and then do the repair that's necessary. And tonight's just an introduction to that. These are just a few of the ways. And gaslighting, though, is one of the most obvious ones. But what I want you to see from that is I also want you to put yourself in your wife's shoes for a moment, and I want you to think about the forced choice place it puts her in. Whenever we are telling our wife that her reality isn't real, you don't see what you see, you don't hear what you hear, you don't feel what you feel, you're imagining these things, it places her in a state of confusion. It puts her in a place where she has to choose between what she feels, knows, and experiences and what we're saying. It creates a forced choice for the psyche which needs to live in one reality or the other in order to survive. They have to decide, do I believe what he's telling me or do I believe what I know? And what you need to understand is, it's not like they can stand there and choose both. It's not like they can take a basket in each hand. They have to go through a doorway. They have to choose one of the two doors. And whichever door is chosen, the relationship with the other is injured. And so this slide can, so they are forced to choose between their primary attachment or themselves. And guys, this is where we need to step back and remember what happened for our wife when we married her. Go all the way back to the beginning of God's design and instructions about marriage. He says, for this reason, a husband will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Okay, that passage is written to men. It's written to everyone, but it's written from the perspective of men. But the same thing happened for our wives. 
When we come into this world, we come in attached to our mother and father. And yes, I know we all have different struggles of how well we were bonded and attached there. But the bottom line is, our mother especially, but our mother and father are our primary attachments. But when we choose to get married, one of the things we do is we leave our primary attachment of mom and dad, and then we assign our spouse as our new primary attachment. When your wife said, I do, when she left her home, she moved in with you. She chose to attach to you. And again, attachment is the foundation of our human brains. It's the foundation of who we are. It is the deepest panic we have when that attachment is broken. And so our wives are in this place where they have to choose, do I believe my husband's words? Do I believe in this reality that he's creating? Or do I believe what is happening inside of me? And if I find the courage to believe and trust what's happening to me, then I risk losing connection with my primary attachment. And the result is they are in an incredibly painful place of decision. Sometimes, you know, in previous in sexual addiction recovery, many times wives were wrongly labeled as dysfunctional because they could not see the truth, because they wouldn't, they refused to believe. They lived in so much denial. When you understand attachment and you understand this forced choice, it makes sense. Because in their place of needing attachment, they desperately wanted to believe us. And guess what, guys? We completely misused that trust. We completely took advantage of this attachment panic that we all have as a way to keep our secret basement, secret world spinning. And so I want you to look at the damage this does. I want you to look at the mechanics of gaslighting. One of the things that we're learning about the brain and the body these days is how much information transfers between the brain and the gut. That our gut picks up on things that we don't necessarily, you know, we don't hear them, we don't see them, but we just kind of pick them up. And, you know, have you ever heard the expression, I felt it in my gut? Well, there's actual real science behind that now. And so what I want you to see is how these two worlds collide in this place. If you look on the, on the right side of the screen, there is the abuser. Dr. Manwala expresses it. And his enteric, it's called the enteric system. And the enteric system is our gut, it's our body, it's everything our body picks up on. And the enteric system, the gut, of the abuser is saying, I've got to protect my secret sexual basement. I've got to protect my secret world because that's, in many times, that's life for me. And not only that, I've got my own attachment panic because I'm terrified if my wife finds out about my secret basement, I might lose her, so therefore I have to protect that. Okay? Reminds me of the story many, many years ago in group. We had a guy visit for a few, he was here for, he and his wife came to do a couple days of work with me and he came to group that night. And so he was telling his story. And what's really good about this one is this guy was from Scotland and he had a deep Scotland, Scottish accent. And so as he's telling his story, he had a line that I'll never forget. He was telling his story and he said, I was so desperate for my wife to trust me that I had no choice but to lie to her. And think how nonsense that is. And yet how much sense it makes to us. 
Because our gut, our enteric system says, I am so desperate for my wife to trust me. I can't lose her, so therefore I can't let her know what's going on here. I can't put that at risk. And so from that place of our gut, it comes up into our brain, and out come our words that are what Dr. Manwala calls our intentionally manipulated reality. It's how we spin things how we create a world, how we tell them, no, it's not dark outside, it's bright as day and it's midnight. Now, we don't say that because that's ridiculous. But is it any more ridiculous to say, I, I don't know how that ended up in the internet history. I've never done that. Or I, I, I don't know whose number that is. I don't know how those charges are on our credit card. I'll call tomorrow and get those charges removed. Those are fraudulent charges. So the IMR comes out of the husband's mouth into the wife's ears and her brain, and then it comes down into her gut, and her gut says, this doesn't add up. This doesn't make sense. And so she's left in this place of, I need my attachment, I need my connection, but my truth doesn't work. And so she lives in this turmoil. Side note on here, guys. It's one of the reasons I believe, and many in this field are becoming more convinced of, and that we need more research about, it's why so many wives of men with secret sexual basements have autoimmune diseases, have other forms of physical issues. Dr. Manwala has noted in their clinic when he was doing uh, inpatient work that there was an incredible uh, overlapping when they would have husbands build their timeline of their significant acting out and then they would have a, their wives write out their timeline of physical episodes. And that when they would overlap those two timelines, they found an incredible correlation between husbands acting out and deceiving about it with wives' physical symptoms. I think... Many in this field are, are concluding that it's because of this reality that's happening. It's that tug of war that a wife has internally. Do I trust my gut or do I trust my attachment? Again, it brings it back to that impossible choice. Do I believe what my primary attachment is telling me? Or do I believe my God? And what you need to understand is that every single time she overrides her own sense of her own sense of safety, her own sense of what is true and right to believe her husband, she loses connection with herself. And it's not like this happens once or twice, or three or four times, or a few times a year. It happens day after day after day after day. And it leads to something that's called complex trauma shaping. Making the same choice over and over to ignore my gut starts to shape the psyche with complex trauma shaping. Probably one of the easiest ways to understand complex trauma shaping is to think of a rock underwater. You know, if a rock sits someplace where water drips on it a couple times a month, it doesn't have much impact, right? But if water drips on that rock minute after minute after minute, 
hour after hour after hour, day after day, week after week, year after year for centuries, what's going to happen to that rock? It's going to be reshaped. Same principle holds true. If you're called stupid a couple times on the playground, it probably doesn't have a big effect. If you were called stupid every day of your childhood by an older brother or parent or someone in your family, guess what? It's going to have a much greater effect. And when your primary attachment is constantly spinning your world, it creates CTS, complex trauma shaping. Well, that's the ugly side for tonight. But what do we do to make things different? How do we change from being a predator to being a protector? How do we allow the God-given innate protector within us to override the predator that has many times consumed us? Well, to begin with, and there, we could spend many hours on this, but the first thing I want us to focus on is that if we want to move from being a predator to a protector, I think step number one is to shine focused light on our harmful behaviors. If you want something to change, if you want it to be different, start paying attention to the ways that you are not acting like your true self. And again, in that when I'm saying this, I'm not just talking about stopping the acting out, sexual acting out behaviors. Do you need to stop those? Absolutely. But even more important than stopping the sexual acting out behaviors is stopping the deception and the way that the deceptions create this conflict for our wives of do I believe my gut or do I believe what my husband is saying and doing and the world that he is creating. The greatest harm does not come from the sexual acting out behaviors, but from the deceptions that accompany and cover up those acting out behaviors. And so that's why we updated our check-in procedure for group. And so I teach my men, I teach teaching my guys now that when you do a check-in, we've added point number four, modified point number four. And point number four for our check-in is, are there any sexual sins, deceptions, or other IABs, integrity abuse behaviors, page 248 in my New Hope for Sexual Integrity manual, that I need to bring into the light? Especially, am I clean with my wife or am I holding any secrets? Guys, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to shine a light on your deception and bring it into the light on a regular, consistent basis. In fact, I'm recommending to guys now that you do a daily check-in. Go ahead and do all eight, but especially on point four. Bringing any deception you have, no matter how minor it seems, bring it into the light, because after all, what does Scripture say? If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and what? The blood of His Son, Jesus, cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Bring them into the light. You say, well, what are the IABs? Well, we don't have time to cover them tonight, but here's part of the list. This first list are the list uh, that Dr. Manwala has identified as integrity abuse behaviors that happen prior to our wife discovering the basement. And just a few of those. Lying, lying by omission, gaslighting that we've talked about, um, blaming others, not my fault, uh, relational neglect, withdrawal, rejection, including sexual rejection, Intentional withholding of life-altering information necessary for survival. Guys, have you thought about the fact that whenever you have a secret basement in operation, 
your wife cannot give informed consent? Because she doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't know what the reality is. And then, as if it's not bad enough that we did all these things while we had the secret sexual basement, unfortunately, even when discovery happens, even after disclosure, even when guys are working hard on their recovery, guess what? Then there's still, in the overt phase, a whole other list of behaviors that we have done. Again, we don't have time for all of them, so I'll just hit a few. Again, lying, lying by omission. Question, did the lies stop once you came clean the first time? Mine didn't. Again, the lying has been deeply ingrained within us. Um, Mike Warnke uh, get, had a great monologue about this many years ago. Mike Warnke has one of his monologue, a Christian comedian, had a, a monologue where he starts off and he says, you know, parents use questions to raise us all their li our lives. And the number one question moms ask is, what do you think you're doing? To which he replied very sarcastically, well, mom, it doesn't matter what I think I'm doing. It doesn't even matter what I am doing because I'm not going to be in trouble for what I think I'm doing or even what I am doing. I'm only going to be in trouble for what you think I'm doing. And we can laugh about that. And we've all been there. But because we've been there, that became our reality. We learned to tell people not what was true, but what we thought would be safe for us. And so we took a childhood strategy of survival in many people's case, because our parents at times were very scary. And that childhood survival Strategy has become a lifetime strategy. A question comes to me, and, not, and my answer is immediately without thinking, not the truth, but whatever I think you want to hear. It would be wonderful if once a man came clean, that if the gaslighting went away. I've had guys gaslight their wives about coming to group. I've had guys who drive to Lawrence from another town because they knew that their wife would see the location on the phone. But not a 10 group. And then she says, everything all right? You, don't, you just don't see him yourself? No, I'm great. We had a great group, great, great time. Blaming others, especially blaming our spouse. It would be wonderful if that stopped when recovery started. But it's deeply ingrained in us. Minimizing, partial disclosures, staggered disclosures. How many individuals I've worked with through the years who've um, said, you know, oh, well, I'll tell her this much, I'm not telling her that much. One individual comes to mind from a few years ago, and he finally came clean to me about an affair that he'd had 30 years ago. He'd already told his wife about one affair. He even told his wife about a child that he had that she didn't know about previously. But he had another affair that he didn't tell her. And when I told him, I said, you know, there's no moving forward without telling her that. Guess what? I've not seen him in two years. Because he believes he can take that one to his death. Even though he's lifted the hatch, he's let her see into the basement, he's saying, but I'm not coming clean with all of that. Shifting focus to the abuser's pain. When the wife is hurting, talking about how I'm hurting instead. Uh, lack of demonstrated empathy. Violating agreements or commitments. Husband says, okay, I've got a boundary, a 10 o'clock boundary, all TV, all digital, everything shuts off at 10 o'clock. Wife falls asleep, wakes up at 1 o'clock. Why is the TV on? Her alert, her alarm system is in high, you know, high whist, bells and whistles. And he's like, oh, well, it's no big deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal. 
because it's an integrity violation because you said you would not do that and you are doing that. Now, guys, we need to recognize that these lists are long and we are not going to be perfect. But here's the reality. The priority is, in reduce, is not in stopping the acting out behaviors, but is in reducing harm. And how do we reduce harm? We start telling the truth. If I fail on one of my commitments and agreements, guess what? I need to be the one that brings that into the light. I need to be the one who comes to my accountability group. I need to be the one that comes to my therapist. I need to be the one who comes to my wife and says, you know that boundary I set that I said I wouldn't do? I crossed that boundary. Sorry, I failed in this place. I broke that boundary. Does that still hurt? Yes. But it's being a man of integrity. We must shine focused light on harmful behaviors. And then secondly, we must teach boys and men how to see the humanity of all women. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul tells a young Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2. He says, treat younger, women as, younger men as brothers... Older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters. And then notice the last phrase, with absolute purity. Okay? Timothy was a young minister. How young? I don't know. Unfortunately, I'm convinced he's quite a bit younger than me. So if Paul were writing to me or an older minister, I think Paul would have said this. So bear with me with Daryl's translation for me. I think Paul would write to me, Daryl, treat older women as mothers, women your age as sisters, and younger women as daughters with absolute purity. And so from that, I've come up with the idea that God, had, God intends for us as men to have four healthy categories for women. And let me tell you where, well, let me just give you the categories and I'll tell you where it came from. That every woman in my life is either a mother, a sister, a daughter, or a wife. Side note, wife is a category to one. That one's filled in my life. So that makes it real easy. It's A, B, or C. It's simple, multiple choice. But where this category idea came from was a number of years in group. A number of years ago in group, I had a man in his 50s who made a statement I'd heard before from a number of different men. He said, you know, just shaking his head in frustration, he says, I do not think I'm capable of seeing a beautiful woman and not going to lust. And a moment of inspiration hit me, and I said, oh, really? Well, let's think about that for a minute. And I said... Um, you have daughters, right? He said, yeah, I've got two daughters. I said, okay, how old are they? I think one of them was like 25, 26. The other one was 21, 22. I said, okay. I said, are they beautiful? Proud Papa kind of grins a little bit. And he says, yeah, of course, they're beautiful. I said, do they have female body parts? And now he's getting a little nervous and he looks at him. He says, well, yeah, of course they do. I said, well, do you lust after them? And he almost got angry and he said, well, no, of course not. And I said, why not? He said, well, because they're my daughters. They've always been my daughters. And I looked at him and I smiled and I said, see, you are capable of seeing a beautiful woman and not going to lust. The problem is not that you don't have that ability. The problem is you have not strengthened that muscle and learned how to practice that ability with anyone other than your own physical daughters. And just a quick side note here, guys. 
in sexual addiction. There are a number of men who have also struggled with lusting after their own physical daughters. You say, so this doesn't apply. Absolutely it applies. Because men who struggle with fantasy or lust or inappropriate sexual contact with their own daughters, it's because they've lost sight of the fact that they are daughters. And those categories have completely gone out of their mind. And, side note on that, Individuals who struggle in that, those, those intense ways invariably have significant trauma, significant early sexual exposure, and issues that if we really understand their story, doesn't make it acceptable, but makes it more understandable. We have the ability to see every woman we encounter in life as a mother, a sister, or a daughter. But guys, it takes retraining the brain. Because what did we grow up with? How were we taught initially to categorize women? Hot or not, vulnerable or not. So retraining the brain means taking a new process with every woman we encounter in person, every woman we encounter in media, and asking a critical question of Jesus. Jesus, who is she to me? And then the follow-up question, how can I be her protector? Again, circling right back to where we began. Each one of us has a heart that wants to be a protector. When we're flying through life on autopilot, we're going to revert back to the old ways of being predators. And we're going to look at women at hot or not, or vulnerable or not. But when we slow down, take a deep breath, and say, Jesus, who is she to me? we activate a new part, not a new part of our brain, I believe a deeper part of our brain that God has given us when he created us in his image. Asking Jesus these questions engages our God-given protector pathways. Now, I've been teaching this concept for several years now. And I've had a number of men kind of look at me and say, yeah, I tried that. That didn't really work for me. I just got to keep bouncing my eyes. You know the big problem with bouncing your eyes, besides the headache you get? Is it leaves you in a fear state. It leaves you in a place where you're afraid of every woman you encounter. And so when you're afraid, guess what happens? Your amygdalas start taking over. You go in survival mode. And when you go in survival mode, what do you do? Whatever it takes to survive. What was the fir- one of the first, category- first ways we learned to survive when we were afraid? Sexual fantasy, sexual acting out. Do you see the looping problem? But when you engage your brain differently, when you start asking Jesus, who is she to me, and how do I protect her, it's going to feel strange initially. It's going to be slow. You're going to miss the exit. In fact, the analogy I use here is that it's like driving down the turnpike between here and Wichita, and you're driving 75, okay, 80 miles an hour down the road, and trying to find a footpath that goes off in the tall grass on the Flint Hills. You see, retraining our brain requires many repetitions because we're not even used to looking for it. So picture that. If you're driving down at 80 80 miles an hour looking for a footpath, and let's say the first time you actually see it, how did you see it? Well, odds are you slowed down. 
I told you what mile marker it was at. You were looking for it carefully, and you slowed down enough, you saw it, oh, there it is. You turn your car off the turnpike, and you drive down this little trail. The first 10 times you do it, guess what? It's going to require you to slow down that way. But question, if a thousand cars got off at that path and drove through the Flint Hills at that particular place, and you were the thousand and first car, how hard would that path be to see? Be easy to see. That'd be dirt, might be mud, depending on the weather, but the path becomes easier to see. The same thing happens in our brains. You say, I've tried it, it doesn't work for me, keep at it. It's literally a retraining of the brain. You know, being in Lawrence, Kansas, um, I've spent the last 23 years here. You get uh, an affinity to KU basketball. You get to enjoy some fun stuff. And out of that, one of the things that I've heard Bill Self say on several occasions is something to the effect of, I always want to get past Christmas break. And he's usually talking about his freshmen. He says, because prior to Christmas break, we're just, we're just going, we're practicing, we're playing some games, but over Christmas break, we get a bunch of extra practice time in. And he said that many times, it's over that break that you can see the light bulbs go off in some of these gifted athletes. Because prior to getting that enough repetitions in, they're going slow, they're thinking hard, they're trying not to make a mistake and get in his doghouse. And then when they've had enough repetitions, it's like the gears fall in place and they can just play. Guys, just try to imagine... How many repetitions of hot or not, vulnerable or not, your brain went through from the time you were a little boy till you got into recovery? So the fact that your brain is still struggling to make those connections of who is she to me, how do I be her protector? Be kind to yourself there. But also be disciplined and say... I need to do whatever I need to do to slow down and to make that transition. And I need to keep doing it over and over and over again until it becomes my new normal. And that's how we transition from protector, from predator to protector we begin seeing every woman in our lives as a mother, a sister, a daughter, and of course we see our wife. But in order to make that transition, I think at the core we have to remember who am I? See, many guys, one of their real struggles in recovery is their shame and their toxic shame. They've been told all their lives they're nothing but dirt. They're nothing but scum. They're nothing but a pervert. And guys, that just isn't true. Okay? Genesis 1.27 says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female... He created them. I can't tell you how many people have asked me through the years, how do you do what you do? How do you hear these horrible stories? How do you work with individuals in these incredibly messy places? And I'll tell you more than anything, the reason I'm able to do what I do is because God helped me see in my own recovery journey and then early on working with others that at the core of every human being is the treasure of someone who is uniquely created in the image of God. 
Now, there's all kinds of mess that's covering up that image. And sometimes it takes some real work to wade through the crap, to wade through the mess, till you can see glimmers of that treasure. But I have never taken the time, effort, and energy to get to know someone and really know their story, know their struggle, that I haven't stood back and said, Wow, God, this person is a treasure. One of my guys in group many years ago gave me a beautiful illustration of this. When he was growing up, one of his real sources of safety connection was his grandparents. They lived out in the middle of nowhere, western Kansas, and he would go out and spend much of his summer with them. And every Sunday, they would leave the farmhouse, they would go into town, and they would go to this little bitty church. And they would gather with six, eight, ten other people, and they would have church. And they were what is called one cuppers, meaning they took communion from a single cup. Well, when his grandparents got older, is what so often happens in some of these small farming communities, the church got to the place where it closed its doors. His grandparents, however, took the silver goblet that that church had used for communion. They had it in their house for a little while, and whenever he would visit, he would have a pleasant memory about that goblet. Years went by, his grandparents passed away. And after the last of them passed away, the family did what I thought was a pretty creative, unique way of dividing up the personal effects. They invited all the family in for an auction of the personal items, the things that were not designated in the will. So they had tables strung out and different items on the tables. And when my friend got there, he saw that goblet on the table. Only it didn't look like silver anymore. It was badly tarnished, been stored out on a shelf in the garage. It was covered in dust, caked in pigeon poop. But my friend saw treasure. And so they had divvied up Monopoly money to everybody in the family and said, put your money on what you want. And he went and he put every Monopoly dollar he had on the goblet and he took it home. No one else bid. No one else was even interested in it. Why? Because they didn't have the attachment and because they didn't know the treasure that it was. He took it home, cleaned it up, polished it, and it has been the centerpiece on his mantle ever since. And guys, that's my privilege. I know your messes. And I know that many of those messes are big, they're ugly, they're bad. We have done great harm in this arena. And the world and many times people in the church, they look at us, they look at individuals struggling in this arena and they want to write us off, they don't want to see it, they, don't want, to, they want to pretend it doesn't happen there. I was told in one church meeting, we don't want to be the pervert church, let's don't have those meetings here. But here's what I know. Underneath the pigeon poo, underneath the tarnish, Every single one of you is an image bearer. And so I believe that recovery is about honestly facing the mess and at the same time discovering, grabbing hold of, claiming what's deeper than the mess. Do you realize that Genesis 1 comes before Genesis 3, the fall? That original glory preceded original sin? 
that original glory is greater than original sin? You are not your sin. You are not your mess. But your mess has done great harm. Yes, it has. And we've got to face it. And we've got to do the work to help those we've harmed heal. And at the same time, the only way we're going to get through that is to hang on to the truth that we are image bearers and that we reflect the glory of God. Because otherwise, we're going to slip back into our shame and we're going to end up repeating the cycles. But when we grab hold of who we are and be the image bearer that God made us, then we can make that transition from predator to protector. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning and we just acknowledge that the mess is deep, the mess is big, but you are bigger and you are greater. And that our wives and others that we've harmed through our secret sexual basements, they need great care. And they need us to do everything we can to repair the harm we've done. And they also need us to recognize that we can't fix it. That when we created the basement, when we messed with their enteric system, when we messed with their second brain, we did harm that's greater than we will ever be able to repair. That we are powerless to fix it. But Lord, we are empowered to become men of integrity, to break the patterns of integrity abuse, that we are empowered to trust you, that you can use our now honest ways to create an authentic reality that creates an environment where healing can take place. And that ultimately, Lord, you are the healer. You are the one who brings beauty out of ashes. And so, Lord, we come to you this evening and we just lay ourselves and we lay our wives down at your feet. And we ask for you to do what only you can do to heal us, to heal our wives, to heal our relationships. And then, Lord, to empower us to live authentic, transparent lives of integrity going forward. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we leave this place tonight, let me just remind you, you are an image bearer and living like one is the most healing thing you can do for your wife for your children for your brothers in recovery and for everyone you will encounter in your life and with that time to go to check-in groups and check in especially on point four thanks guys <laughs>